Welcome to or welcome back to Endurance Icons, where we sit down with individuals crushing it in the world of endurance sports. Today, we have Kara Kasdorf, sports nutritionist on the podcast today. So as we've seen in a number of our episodes, uh, in our first 19 episodes, that nutrition is a massive part of the puzzle piece in high performance and pretty much mentioned on every single episode and lots of questions from our listeners. So we wanted to bring you guys the goods today. So we brought our, our favorite expert on Kara. How's it going today, Kara? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're pumped to have you. Lots of, uh, lots of good topics today. So on the podcast today, we're going to focus more on um, workout and race fueling and hydration. And we'll save uh, for another podcast coming up uh, something around the day-to-day -day nutrition, because I think that needs a whole podcast of its own. So we'll uh, we'll focus on that from the kind of performance and recovery lens today. So maybe if you want to just kick it off, Kara, maybe tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and your uh, company, Blueprint, Blueprint Nutrition. For sure. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So um, I'm a registered dietitian and I co-own a business called Blueprint Nutrition. Um, I've always uh, had an interest in sport nutrition. Um, I've been a dietitian for 16 years. Uh, and right out of my master's degree, I started a practice in sport nutrition. I was lucky enough to have a mentor who was uh, an elite uh, marathoner in Canada at the time and, and also a dietitian and had a, had a practice in sport nutrition. And she uh, knew that was an interest of mine and kind of asked me if I wanted to take over her practice because she was doing some other things professionally, um, which was a great opportunity for me as a new grad to kind of jump into that world. Um, and so, yeah, ever since then, I've had a practice in sport nutrition. In 2018, I decided to kind of make it more of a full time thing because I was always doing kind of multiple things. Um, so I joined one of my friends and colleagues, Roseanne Robinson, and we decided to come together and co-own uh, a company. And uh, so we have two divisions. We have the sport nutrition division, which is what I do. And I have another dietitian working with me there. And then Roseanne heads up our child and family health division, which is a completely separate area of expertise. But um, yeah, so we're, we're based in Waterloo, Ontario, but we do work virtually with clients and athletes across Canada. Nice. And who are the clients you're uh, most typically working with? So my specialization is in endurance athletes. So I would say the majority of my caseload is working with marathon runners and triathletes and cyclists and ultra marathoners. Um, and then we do have, you know, teen athletes in various team sports and things like that as well. Um, and we work with different organizations. Um, but primarily, I work with endurance athletes. Cool. And before we get into it, what uh, what is your kind of uh, sporting past and what are you currently up to these days? Yeah, so um, I'm a runner. I've been a runner for most of my life, um, which I'm kind of seeing some of the, the repercussions of now, perhaps, as I'm, I've been dealing with some injuries over the last couple of years. But um, started running in junior high, ran in high school. You know, it's always been a huge passion of mine. Um, I started running marathons when I was in my 20s. It was just kind of this fascination I had ever since I watched my first marathon at the age of 16, I was like, you know, when you see something and you're like, that looks awful, but also I know I really want to do that at some point. <laughs> um, so this like fascination and this goal that I set for myself. So when I was probably 19 or 20, I ran my first half marathon and was like, oh, this is so fun. Like it was, you know, it was just like an enjoyable long run. And so I was like, I can do a full marathon, no problem. So the next year, I sign up for the full marathon. And at this point, I was not a dietitian. I, you know, I didn't have a lot of training in sport nutrition. And so I decided to run a marathon without really fueling at all. And it was the worst experience of my life. And I finished and uh, I was like, I'm never, I'm never doing that again. Like, there's no way I'm ever going to put myself through that again. I don't even remember the last part of the race. And then of course, like, you know, a year and a half later, I'm back out there running another marathon just to like prove to myself that I can do it. Um, and so I always say like, you know, my personal best time in the marathon is 313. And that's over an hour off of my first marathon time. <laughs> but really, it's just because my first marathon was so awful and I was so unprepared that I don't know if that's actually like something to be proud of. But um, but yeah, I'm training for uh, Twin Cities Marathon in the fall now. Um, trying to get back into, into marathons after having kids and, you know, all of that fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to it. 
Sounds like a common first marathon story. I feel like we had the like same experiences where I was just like crushing it through the first half and then didn't feel and just like walked it in from there. Totally. I know my family saw me at like 35 K and my mom was like ready to call an ambulance. She's like, (laughs) she's like, you look terrible. Like you, I'm like, yeah, I don't even remember seeing you. So (laughs) yeah, I was broken for weeks after that. Like I'm so jealous of the people who like find a coach in a club right away and get to navigate all that stuff right away. I'm like, I, to learn so many mistakes yeah. before I figured this out. I feel out. like I learned a lot. Like I, ex- I know what that experience feels like. And so I can help people through it. Yeah. Yeah. And marathons I, feel way better now. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's so counter though. Like when you get into running, cause you want to be healthy, but then everything tells you that, you know, it, like common health news say like cut carbs, don't have sugar. Totally. And so it's so at odds with the journey that they're on, but like carbs are everything when you're an endurance athlete. Totally. And I think that was the biggest thing. Like I was fueling, I wasn't fueling well when I, you know, I was eating in a way that was more restrictive and yeah, kind of, you know, following more the common like health stuff that's out there. Right. Um, And I think that's one of the biggest kind of mindset shifts, especially with, you know, recreational runners. And as they're kind of getting more into running is that like fueling for an athlete is much different in a lot of ways than just kind of like healthy eating right so we kind of have to look at that and when it's appropriate to make that shift and all of that kind of stuff so when uh when athletes are first coming to work with you what are kind of the most common challenges or goals they're kind of after when they're uh they're coming to see you for the first time yeah so I mean a lot of the athletes that come to see me initially you know they're coming to me obviously because they're they're maybe struggling with their nutrition um they're often feeling like really run down um, often struggling with things like low iron, um, finding their training is really tough to get through. Sometimes they're very confused about like, what do I do during a a long workout? And like, how much should I be drinking and taking in during and afterwards and all of that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes they're, you know, kind of struggling with feeling really hungry or like having, you know, increased cravings for certain foods and things like that, because they, they haven't been able to adjust their diet to keep up with their training. Um, so those are kind of some of the common things that we'll often see, see people come in into us with. So one of the things that I want to talk about is, and I, you see this all the time promoted for athletes is fasted workouts. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your take on that as a dietitian specifically in the endurance world? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, for me, fueling always takes priority. I've seen just anecdotally so many athletes come to me that have have been injured after they've started doing fasted workouts. And I think a lot of times when people do it, like, especially when they're doing it, like without a strategy behind it and just doing all their workouts fasted because they, you know, saw on social media that that's what so-and-so is doing, or that's a good strategy. Um, the risk of injury is really, really high. And the risk of kind of getting into that kind of energy deficient state is really high. And I've even seen with, um, you know, Olympic level runners where, you know, strategically they have implemented fasted workouts, but then have actually seen injuries occur or changes in hormone levels and things like that. And to me, the, the, the risk is just too high and the benefit doesn't outweigh the risk. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really promote fasted workouts. I don't think, um, that for most people, they're not going to see the the type of benefit, but they, the risk is pretty high in terms of injury. And is there any difference between males and females? Like you mentioned hormones. Um, is there a greater mm-hmm. risk for, I I think I've heard that like female athletes, it's a greater risk than males for fasted. Yeah. So females do tend to be more sensitive in terms of their hormone levels to fasting. Um, and that can even occur changes in, in things like estrogen can occur even with, you know, a day or like fasting for one day or having, you know, a, a couple fasted workouts. So um, it's not something that even happens long term, but it can be pretty short term. Um, but there are definitely cases in male athletes, too, where we see testosterone levels drop from doing fasted workouts. And so we know that has huge implications in terms of, of performance and overall health as well. So I know that a lot of our athletes are like age group 
um, athletes that need to fit in a lot of training around like a full-time job. So that means a lot of early morning workouts. Um, that's really tough. If you're getting up at like four 5 AM and you're, you know, immediately going out for a workout, mm-hmm. what's your advice around those early morning workouts to make sure that you're fueling the work and yeah. not needing to get up at like 3 AM to do totally. it. I know it gets so complicated when it's like, you're getting up so early. Um, I remember getting a, an email from one of my clients at like four in the morning and I'm like, why are they e- emailing me in the middle of the night? And I'm like, Oh no, like he was just getting up for his workout and like emailing me what he was putting in his bottles. And I'm like, it's just like, you know, the dedication is like so intense, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you, first of all, you want to make sure you're eating enough on a day-to-day basis, right? But oftentimes kind of backing up even and looking at the night before, like, are you having an evening snack, right? Like that can already be part of your fueling strategy for a morning workout. Um, and then having something quick before a workout. So even if it's 15 minutes before, you know, having something that's mainly carbohydrate based. So that could be a drink, right? Like that could be juice or a sports drink, or it could be a, you know, a bar, an energy bar or a fig bar, or granola bar or something like that. Um, but having something is going to be the priority. So even if you're getting up and like hopping on the bike or going out for a run, um, having, you know, something in you is still going to be still going to be beneficial in terms of the impact on your body and your, you know, your hormone levels and all of that kind of stuff. And what would a good like bedtime snack look like if you have a big workout in the morning? Hmm. So you always want to have that, that mix of carbohydrates and protein, right? So even having something like some toast with peanut butter and a glass of, you know, chocolate milk or a bowl of cereal with some nuts and seeds on it or something like that, or a bowl of oatmeal. Like, you know, I have a few clients that love doing like overnight oats, but do it as an evening snack, right? Like it's like that good, long lasting, sustaining energy source. And so you don't want to shy away from the evening snack. I know sometimes people feel like I shouldn't be eating before bed. And like, again, for athletes, like really really like that's not going to have any negative impact. Like you're not going to, you know, eat something and gain a bunch of fat overnight. Like it's just like your body needs all of that fuel. Right. So having something to eat as an evening snack can be really, really beneficial. And I know we're going to get into this when we bring you back to talk about like day-to-day nutrition, but I think that's been the most eye-opening experience for me is the fact that you almost need to throw out everything that you've heard that is a healthy diet. Like as an endurance athlete, the rules don't apply to you. You need, you know, like juice, I think was a big one. It's like, have that at every meal or chocolate milk, like the carbs as much as possible. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And that's something like working through that shift in mindset can be so challenging for some people, right? Like they're like, well, I never have juice in my house. Like, it's just not something I do. It's like, well, (laughs) like (laughs) time to unlearn. Yeah. Um, So yeah, it is, it's kind of interesting to kind of walk through that and really then also see the benefits of doing those things, right? Because it can be a little bit like, ooh, like, should I actually be doing this? Um, But then when you see the benefit to performance and training and energy levels, then you see that it is worth it. So on a day where you're not rushed um, for a first thing, what are your favorite go-to meals for like a pre, like a big pre-workout meal or a race? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think a lot of those things like the, you know, like a nice big bowl of oatmeal, Um, even like, depending how much time you have, like a bagel and eggs and some fruit, you know, that sort of thing can be a really good pre-workout, um, uh, meal, Uh, but you do want to give yourself a couple of hours in that type of situation. If you're having some protein and fat and, and the carbohydrates, obviously, um, you do want to give yourself, you know, maybe two hours to digest and then maybe have a little top up before your workout where you take in, you know, a sports drink or gel or granola bar or something like, you know, 15 to 30 minutes beforehand. And on those early morning workouts, just one, uh, one other item, we talked a little bit about the fueling, but from the hydration side, what are some of your tips mm-hmm. there? I feel like I always wake up like very dehydrated. What do you, yeah. what's kind of your, your totally. recommendations to, to make sure yeah. you're adequately hydrated for this as well? Yeah. Yeah. I always, cause when we look at hydration, obviously we want to be well hydrated on a day-to-day basis, but when we wake up, we are somewhat dehydrated. So I find it's a good strategy to actually have an electrolyte drink the night before and then the morning of as well, because those electrolytes do help with rehydration after an overnight fast as well. Um, So having something with electrolytes in it, especially sodium can be helpful to kind of help with that rehydration process. But if you can get 500 mils in before a workout, that's ideal. Um, If it's like, you don't want to be like chugging, you know, (laughs) chugging it 10 minutes before. So um, if you can't get that amount in, that's fine, but then maybe just have a little extra the night before if possible. Yeah. I find like morning of, I have my like water that's always beside my bed. And then I like, 
if there's any left, I'm just like walking on my way to the washroom, just like chugging yeah. that in the morning. Like, I need to hydrate. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Having something first thing, a nice big cup of, of water or something can be helpful. And okay. So Mark and I are like just over a week out from our marathon. Right. So I want to talk about carb loading. Yeah. Tell us everything, you know, is it something that we should be doing like pasta only leading into the race or <laughs> For every the meal? Best, <laughs> what's the best approach? Yeah. So carb loading is a, is a big topic. And I think a lot of people feel like they think they know what carb loading is, but maybe don't really know what it is. And again, I have made all the mistakes in carb loading, so I can speak from experience about what not to do and what to do. But when we look at the research, um, really carb loading is effective for events lasting longer than 90 minutes. So it, for most people, that's kind of like the half marathon and beyond. Um, and we want to do the carb load about 24 to 48 hours before the event. So kind of the, the day, two days beforehand. Um, and I always talk about being really strategic with the carb load, right? Like some people think it's just like eat everything in sight or like eat a huge plate of pasta the night before. And those things, you know, like mainly the pasta can be part of it. Don't eat everything in sight necessarily, but um, but you do want to be strategic about how you're including the carbohydrates, right? Because you don't want to be um, fat loading or fiber loading, right? Which sometimes happens if we're having, you know, just whatever and just, you know, I just need to eat more. So I'm just going to eat a whole bunch of whatever I feel like. Um, then sometimes that can lead to just feeling really uncomfortable and full and like not feeling your best. Like obviously you want to go into the race feeling your best. And so we want to be strategic about how we're adding those carbs. Um, the amount of carbs that's recommended for a carb load is based on your body weight. So it's recommended to about eight to 12 grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight. So if you do the math, um, and if you're familiar with kind of carbohydrate amount in foods, um, it's a lot of carbohydrate to be eating those days. So if you're not planning it out, you're probably not getting enough carbohydrates, right? Like your plate of pasta might be a hundred grams of carbs, but if you need 700 grams for the day, like it's going to be hard to fit that in. Um, so eating often throughout the day, like every couple of hours, um, drinking fluids that have carbohydrates in them can be helpful, like the juice and the chocolate milk and the sports drinks. Um, and then adding in what I call carb boosters, right? So those like quick and easy things that won't necessarily fill you up, but will give you the carbohydrates. So adding extra maple syrup to your oatmeal, right? Or adding um, some extra jam to like peanut butter and toast or having some dried fruit on your cereal, right? Like all of those things can easily add a hundred or even 200 grams of carbs throughout the course of the day. And you're not really feeling like super full from those things, right? But in terms of glycogen stores, they are helping to really like top up those glycogen stores. And there's some research that some of those like faster acting carbohydrates can actually be better for carbohydrate loading and increasing glycogen store in the stores in the muscle. Sometimes I joke that it's like, if you're eating like elf, you're probably doing it okay. <laughs> I was just talking to a client about that the other day. I was, like, I was talking about how my son was like pouring maple syrup on his oatmeal that morning. And I'm like, that's what you got to do. And she's like, it's like, like the movie Elf. I'm like, yes, that's totally what you want to do. You want to channel that energy. We have our pre-race hype movie now. I know. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And what about post-workout? So we finished the marathon. What is the first thing that we can do to start kick starting that recovery and make sure that it's as effective as possible? Yeah. So I think, you know, oftentimes we focus on recovery during training, but even after a race, recovery can be really important um, just because you want to feel good. You want to, you know, maybe get back into training in the next week or two, and you don't necessarily want to be kind of delayed in that. So um, the three things we're looking at are, you know, carbohydrates, obviously, our glycogen stores are depleted. We know carbohydrates are so important for like muscle recovery, glycogen storage, um, even immune function, you know, they play a role in, in that. Sometimes we get sick after a race, and obviously we want to try to prevent that. Um, and then protein obviously is important for muscle tissue repair. And then hydration and electrolytes. So that's a piece that oftentimes people miss, like they might have their chocolate milk and banana or whatever it is. Um, but drinking a high sodium electrolyte drink can actually be really helpful in recovery. Um, and a lot of people notice a, a big difference when they do that kind of right after they're done their race. Hmm. So not just a big protein shake. Um, which is yeah. sort of what I was raised on is that's, yeah, that's totally. all you need for recoveries, just protein. <laughs> 
Yeah, it goes beyond just protein for sure. And that's the other piece too, even in, and we'll obviously get to this in the kind of day-to-day -day training when we talk about that, but um, that carbohydrate after a, a workout or after a race is so critical. And we often miss that because we're just focused on the protein, mm -hmm. right? But think kind of hydration, rehydration with the electrolytes, the carbohydrates, and then the protein as well. Is there anything that you should avoid um, after a hard effort? Like one of the things that I read a lot about is like, like antioxidants, you need that oxidative stress to continue to train the body. Mm -hmm. um, is that true? And is there anything else that we should be avoiding? Yeah. So in terms of antioxidants, a lot of the research is around like antioxidant supplements. So you wouldn't want to be taking a supplement necessarily, but the amount of antioxidants in food doesn't seem to have that same effect. So, um, so there, it's always that balance, right? So having foods like berries or cherries or, you know, dark leafy greens or other foods that are high in antioxidants, um, is not necessarily a bad thing might help with recovery, but won't necessarily like blunt that training effect right afterwards. Um, in terms of other foods, like sometimes high fat foods can kind of delay how quickly the carbs get into our system. So you may not want to have something you probably don't feel like eating like a high fat meal right after a race, but, um, you know, maybe wait a few hours before that, let the kind of nutrients get into your system. And then, you know, and then have something that's a bit higher in fat, but that would be the other thing that you would probably want to avoid. Amazing. So many good uh, pre and post workout and race tips in there. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, let's hop into uh, like in workout and racing and talk about some of the, the pieces athletes need to be looking at in there. So maybe we could kick it off uh, kind of when athletes are looking at fueling uh, like in workout or in a race, what's kind of the, um, the threshold in terms of like the duration of an activity that athletes need to consider starting to fuel mm -hmm. for? Yeah. So typically, um, the recommendations uh, are that anything longer than 90 minutes is when we want to start fueling. Um, but it really depends also on the intensity of the effort. Um, and there is some evidence around taking a little bit of carbohydrate with like a 45 to 75 minute effort if it's more of a higher intensity effort. Um, but typically, if it's kind of like 75 to 90 minutes or longer is when we would start to take fuel in during the, the, the workout. Nice. And is there any, a lot of our athletes are triathletes who are doing uh, multiple workouts a day, things like that. So maybe they have a 61 in the morning, 60 minute workout in the morning and another 60 at night. Would you, would that play into considerations in terms of fueling that a little bit more knowing if they have a second workout in a day? Yeah. So, um, you could, you could fuel during the workout or really focus on the, um, post workout fueling after the first workout, especially, and then throughout the day so that you kind of have that rapid kind of glycogen, you know, kind of storage happening again throughout the day before your next workout. Awesome. Yeah. There's no, there's no harm in fueling for a shorter workout. Um, there's, there may be some benefit if you have a second workout. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I feel like we've definitely noticed the difference when we just like sprinkle in, even if it's just like an extra 30 grams in a bottle for that 60 minute one, just totally. carrying that energy over the day. I think it plays into that whole, like yeah. getting the calories you need over the course of the day. Totally. And we know that taking in carbohydrate during a workout does help with recovery afterwards as well. So even if it's a 60 minute workout, you take in some carbs during that workout, again, no harm. And there's going to be benefit in terms of recovery. I think that that was one of the biggest learnings that I've had over the course of my, I, I would call it career as an athlete mm -hmm. is just learning that I went at the very beginning, I would isolate it to, this is just the workout. So I'm feeling this one specifically, but starting to think it as like this entire program and you're always, you know, recovering for the work to come. Totally. Um, that constant trickle of carbohydrates has just been such a game changer. Yeah. And that's what I always talk about too, is looking at it in the context of your week, right? Like I, I had posted on Instagram about what I had before and after one of my runs and someone messaged me and she's like, well, how long was that run? And I was like, well, it was whatever, 15 or 16 K, whatever it was. I'm like, but you have to look at it in the context of the week too, right? Like, what did I do the day before? What am I doing the next day? What's, you know, what's the weekly volume like? Um, you can't just look at that one workout. You do have to look at it in terms of kind of the whole context of the week or the month. And even, um, you know, I have a full-time job and often I don't view that as TSS or like an energy suck, but mm -hmm. understanding that, you know, on a busy week, I need to view that as almost my training and consider that in the, the energy expenditures that that's going to cause. Totally. And I always, you know, sometimes as like age group athletes, 
Um, we might think like, oh, I'm not like an elite athlete. I don't need to like be eating all this extra stuff or whatever it is. And it's like, you know, when I, when I look at my clients and everything they're doing in a day, it's like ridiculous, right? Like I have, you know, a lot of parents with young kids who also work more than full-time jobs and are training hours upon hours each week. And it's like, that is taking a ton of energy, right? And so if you're not feeling like an athlete, like you are going to be running yourself into the ground. So if you can use that fuel and kind of look at your whole life, not just your training, I mean, that's a huge piece of it. So I'd love to do like a bit of a, like almost case study here for kind of, let's call it like a long distance triathlete, maybe somebody mm -hmm. doing like a half Ironman 70.3 type of thing. Um, would you have like recommendations around, maybe we could focus, we could go bike and then run kind of uh, mm -hmm. in terms of maybe carbs, sodium hydration, what are uh, some of the recommendations you have for like a bike leg around some of those uh those fueling pieces mm -hmm. so we know for distances longer than like for events longer than about two and a half hours we can really increase the carbohydrate intake per hour um so we've seen intakes of you know 90 grams even up to 120 kind of seems like the max is around 140 grams per hour wow. um which is a lot. And like, I've actually never seen an athlete do that before. Um, so I always say like, for me, it's always like, let's look at where you're, where you're at right now and start working up from there. Right. Cause we obviously want to make sure we get our systems used to taking in carbohydrate, but I find for, um, for a triathlon, it's good to kind of get as much as you can on the bike. Um, so kind of targeting, you know, 80, 90 grams per hour, if you can, if you can get a bit higher and still tolerate it, like great. Um, but we're also looking at, um, kind of a mixed fuel source at that point. So anything more than 60 grams an hour, we typically look at getting carbohydrates from glucose or maltodextrin and from fructose, just because it's better absorbed in the, in the gut. Um, so I would be looking at kind of that working towards that amount of carbohydrate. Then if we're looking at fluid and, and then for the run, it really depends. Like I find a lot of athletes will be like, I don't want to take a lot during the run um because it is just even like you know from a like practical standpoint it can be harder you're also like there's more jostling happening and you're you know lots of things going on you're more fatigued at that point um, but then you might be wanting to target like let's say 50 to 60 grams per hour on the run um if you can go higher then that's great right so you can kind of assess and see where things are at um from a fluid standpoint this is always the tough thing like <laughs> i recommend at least 500 mils per hour if you can get that. Um, but everyone is so different and depends on the conditions and the temperature and all of that kind of stuff. So if you're a very heavy sweater, you might need more than the 500 mils per hour. Um, and race day is always like, it can sometimes be different than training days too, right? Like training days, it can be easier to get fluids in because you're maybe stopping to fill up your bottles and you, you know, have access to more. Whereas like race day, you might not be be having that. And so, um, so sometimes that's a little bit different, but that would be kind of the goal that we're aiming for. And then in terms of electrolytes, um, the, the primary electrolyte that we're concerned with is sodium because that is what is primarily lost in sweat. Um, so again, looking for at least 500 milligrams of sodium per 500 mils of fluids. And most people need more than that, especially the longer the, the distance, usually uh, sodium needs go up. Um, because we're just getting kind of more depleted in terms of hydration. And do, is, is there more considerations like you recommended, um, like say on the bike, that 80 to 90 grams an hour would like, a either faster athlete who might be going at a higher level of intensity or a, a bigger athlete who weighs more, like, do they need to, um, look to be taking in more? What, uh, what changes for that? Yeah. Yeah. So it really depends on the individual. So yes, if it's a bigger athlete, they will likely need more. Um, if it's a faster athlete, it's kind of relative, right? Because it's we're looking at like the intensity um, that that person, like how hard that person is working, right? And so um, it's hard to say like, yes, at this speed, you need, you know, this mm -hmm. amount, this amount, it's more at like, you know, what percentage of maximum um, VO2 max are you working at, right? And so, um, so that's what we would be looking at. So if someone's working at a higher intensity, then they do use more carbohydrate as fuel. 
Um, so then their needs would be higher versus someone who's going um, slower or at an easier pace for them. They'd be utilizing more fat as fuel. Uh, so they wouldn't necessarily need as much carbohydrate. So it really depends on the intensity for that person. Um, so yeah, you know, looking at like, let's say even a shorter race, like a half marathon, you're running that in 90 minutes, you know, 90 minute training run, where you're going an easy pace, you might not need a lot of carbohydrate, 90 minute race pace where you're working pretty hard. Now, all of a sudden your carbohydrate needs go up. And in a race situation, you might actually need more carbohydrate. Yep. And, uh, like Stacy Sims is somebody we've, uh, kind of followed a lot in terms of her uh, stuff around like making sure people aren't considering women like small men. So right. is there some more considerations around like females from either like the sources or the amounts that you kind of take into account when you're, you're building a plan for an athlete? Yeah. So, you know what, it's very individual. So when we look at the research, there's not a ton of research out there on female endurance athletes. So it can make it difficult to kind of, um, you know, to kind of like you, the guidelines aren't different for females and males at this point, right? So when we look at the guidelines, they're similar. So um, there might be some differences in terms of glycogen storage in females versus males. So sometimes we take that into consideration. Um, and I know, I think Stacey Sims is a big proponent of like, don't drink your carbs, eat your carbs and, and keep the, the, the fluids and the food separate and all of that kind of stuff. But really like in the research, there's not a big difference in terms of like getting carbohydrates from fluids versus gels versus whole food sources in terms of how it's utilized in the body. Again, minimal research on females specifically. Um, so it's a very individualized thing. Basically, we kind of like what has been working for you, we play around with different things. And then that's how we would kind of formulate the plan. Yeah, that was going to be kind of my next question around like sources, like, are you, um, always holding like a strong stance in terms of people really sticking to either those, uh, those solid fuel sources or those like liquid gels, drink mixes, or is that, that again, kind of individualized to the person and how, how hungry they get on the, yeah. the bike and stuff. It is totally individualized. Right. And some people are like, I, I want only liquids. Like that's all I want to do. Right. So then we kind of work with that. And if that works for them, great. Other people, yeah. Want a lot of variety or get hungry or want actual solid food. Um, and then there's like the practical considerations of what can I carry with me? What's on the course, you know, what's going to work from that perspective. Um, the only thing that I usually like to talk to people about is like, if you're taking, if you have a, a fluid source of carbohydrates, plus solid or gel, um, just make sure you're not taking too much all at one time, right? Because then that can kind of be a bit tougher for digestion and absorption. And so just kind of making sure you're in your plan that we're planning out when to take what so that you're not just kind of like loading up all the carbs all at once. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about a topic that has been kind of a little bit uh, of a hot topic in triathlon recently, especially with uh, Dr. Dan Plews, who's a, a coach who's doing a lot of the like fat adaptation, right fuel, right time, kind of mm -hmm. ketones, carb timing stuff. What are kind of some of your thoughts around that? Have you like given ketones for performance or like what is some of your uh, thoughts? Around so I have actually tried ketones myself because I got sent some samples. They're extremely expensive. Yeah, I've heard that. And I, <laughs> it was like, I felt bad because I, I tried their like the Delta G little bottles of, have you guys tried them? No, yeah. I haven't. Okay. They're they like, the taste is like awful. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just yeah, like so bad. And then I drank it before a, a workout and yeah, I just got really bad heartburn, which I never do. And so I was like, I can't, I can't take the rest of these. I don't want them like, but now I feel like I'm like wasting money because they're so expensive just sitting in my pantry. Um, but yeah, so I definitely have looked into the research because I know there's a lot of buzz about it. And um, obviously companies wanting to like, you know, not push, but like give their products to, or, or have their products in the hands of athletes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it kind of stems from this whole like fat adaptation thing. Right. Um, and so there's, there was a lot of interest, I would say a few years ago in terms of like, is this the new thing for endurance athletes? Right. Cause obviously fat stores far out exceed and like glycogen stores in the body. So, um, but all of the research is either showing that there's no benefit to fat adaptation so far, um, or, maybe in certain situations, um, but not if you do need to be working at a higher intensity. 
right? So with those higher intensity efforts, we're seeing an impairment in performance. Um, so if you're going at a at a lower intensity, or if you're doing a you know ultra marathon, which maybe is at a at a lower intensity, um, something like that, then you know perhaps there is benefit to doing the fat adaptation, but um, but the research hasn't really shown any benefit in, um, you know, in any kind of like, there's been some research, research done in elite athletes. Um, there's been some case studies done. So like, there's like, the research just isn't there to show us that that's going to be beneficial. The other thing is that in a lot of studies, like participants just can't do like, so you have to do a keto diet to get that fat adaptation. And it's really tough to do that when you're training, um, cause you just don't feel great. Right. And so, um, the dropout rate in a lot of these studies is pretty high because like the side effects are, are, you know, can be pretty bad. You don't feel great. Um, so then there's all these protocols around like carb timing, right? Like what if I take in carbs right before workouts and during workouts and still have some level of ketosis? Um, and again, mixed results with that, right? So, some studies show there's a little bit of improvement in performance. Some studies show no improvement or impaired performance. So, um, so it's hard to say that that's actually a good strategy. It seems like a lot of work for maybe, maybe a little benefit, but like, um, there's not, yeah, there's not a lot of good research behind it at this point to support that. Um, so I, I typically, I mean, I've never suggested that to an athlete. Um, yeah, I just, <laughs> the thought of eating like a high fat, and low carb diet while training to me sounds like awful, but like, yeah, I don't I know. I die a little inside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then the, the ketone uh, supplements came out as kind of instead. So when we go, when we're in ketosis, our liver is producing ketones as uh, um, an alternate fuel source to carbohydrate, right? Um, but then, you know, looking at, well, how can we still get those ketones in our bodies without having to go on a keto diet? Um, was kind of this, you know, the thinking behind these ketone supplements. Um, and again, like really mixed research in terms of their benefit. So the claims are around like it helps with performance if you take it before, um, before a workout. It helps with recovery if you take it afterwards. Um, it helps with like, you know, if you want to lose some weight, it can help with reducing appetite, which I'm like, well, is that even a, a good thing for all athletes? Like maybe, I don't know. It feels like maybe that's not the best use of them, but um, so, and there's lots of different types of ketone supplements out there. So the ketone esters versus the ketone salts, the ketone esters are more effective. And that's what this specific, um, it was called Delta G. I think it might be called something else now, but, you know, developed at Oxford University by a researcher. Um, and out of all the ketone supplements, that one does seem to be kind of like the most um, effective at, in, at like increasing ketones in the blood. Um, but again, not a lot of like conclusive research that it's actually beneficial. So it's not something, and for the cost too, like, it's not something yeah. that I, like if it helped, like for sure, right. Everyone can decide what they want to spend their money on. But if it's like, uh, I don't even really know if it's going to help, like then I don't really see the benefit there. Yeah, no, I've, I've researched a bunch about it and been asked from a bunch of my athletes like about it. And it's just, every time I come across it, it just feels like this thing that's like very hard, a lot of suffering, not a whole lot to back it up. And it's like, yeah. how many people have really like won world championships in the biggest races, like on this, totally. um, yeah, a couple yeah. here and there, but those are like the guys who are like Dan Plews, the guy I'm mentioning yes. is like literally in a lab, like has this so optimized and he's not like fasting as athletes or has them on a keto diet or anything like he's doing little optimizations to like get them that final half a percent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In kind of real life practical settings, it just, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. And I don't think it'll like, it's not very practical for most athletes. Yeah, exactly. The carbs, the, the tried and tested true one. Yes. Like, <laughs> like we know there's many, there's many studies to support carbohydrates and performance. So, <laughs> and plus they're delicious. Everyone yeah. loves carbs. <laughs> there's that too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so if you had an athlete that came to you, like when I look at what is, I find most effective in terms of fueling, um, it often is, you know, gels, the sports drink, um, you know, sugar, um, mm -hmm. and that combination of sugars, mm -hmm. um, how do you, how do you work with athletes who want to fuel from natural sources, especially when training load is high? Is that even possible? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it is possible, but, um, I mean, my question is always, you know, 
why like not that not that you have to use gels and these sports products like for sure you can use whole foods and different sources but essentially like it's the same thing right like glucose is glucose fructose is fructose like so sure like we can do that um and and usually we like with people that with clients that do want more natural sources we'll do like a combination of things so we might make some energy gels or energy bites or bars or things like that um and then you know kind of like also have some products because it's hard to do like it was funny one client was like well I really like this energy bar and I just want to make that and train on that and I was like hey that's fine like let me just do the nutrient breakdown on that and see how much you'd have to eat and like when I did the nutrient breakdown it's like she would have to eat like the whole pan of this bar. And she's like, well, I can't carry that with me. I'm like, well, exa exactly, right? Like we have to be practical about this too. Um, so we incorporated that into her training, like into her plan. Um, but we also had gels and other things in there because it's just really hard to do it just with natural sources. Triathletes are pretty creative. I could see them like building a whole like pan sheet on their arrow bars oh, totally. and, just, yeah. and just eating these little things. 100% would happen. Oh, yeah. Very motivated and yeah, creative. Yeah. <laughs> but with that in mind, like I would imagine you have a lot of education that you need to do. Like you probably get a lot of, um, I'll just say like horror stories of people who come to you at like your very first marathon of like, I didn't yeah. fuel. Yeah. Um, and it's not sometimes when you look at, you know, we've been taught that maybe sugar isn't good for us or yeah. eating right before bed isn't good for us. What are your tactics as a dietitian to, because it's not just prescribing a plan. You're also working against that psychological thing. Mm -hmm. How do you psychologically work with your athletes to help them fuel enough during their workouts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. And that's one of the things I find so fascinating about the world of nutrition is that it's like the science, science part, but also the like psychological aspect of it. And I think for a lot of the athletes I work with, it's kind of working through kind of some of what I call those food rules, right? Around like, well, where did this come from? Like, why do you think that this is bad, right? Sometimes it's related to a fear of weight gain or like oftentimes that's what it's related to or just like a fear of like, well, I don't want to get a chronic disease or diabetes or, you know, that sort of thing. So just kind of working through that and like, okay, this is, you know, obviously something that you, that is taught to us through, you know, society and our culture promotes that. Um, but as an athlete, now we have to look at it in a different way. And so if we start, sometimes that is a big part of like the work I do is just kind of that coaching through that, because for someone to go through that on their own can feel actually pretty scary, right? Like if you're like, oh, I've been like taught not to eat a lot of sugar. Now I'm just going to start eating a lot of sugar. Like that feels wrong to me. That feels really counterintuitive. And so a lot of times it's having someone to guide them through that process, right? Having someone who has the education and the background and the experience to say like, trust me, like you're going to, this is going to feel weird, but trust me, just try this for a week or two and let's see how it feels. Right. And then once they start to feel better and they're like, this is amazing. Like I'm like, my workouts are awesome. I'm like hitting all my paces. I feel strong. Like when they actually see like, mm -hmm. wow, I like feel stronger and I'm not my biggest fear was gaining weight. I'm not seeing that happening, right? Like, it's like, okay, like now we're actually like moving in the right direction. And then that builds further motivation. Um, obviously there are people that have more disordered eating or even like a history of eating disorders where um, it's not obviously that simple all the time, right? Like we really have to work through a lot of different things. And sometimes that includes like a mental health person coming in as well and, and working with them. Um, but yeah, but oftentimes it's, it's kind of like guiding and coaching them through that. So, and often we talk about, sometimes it can feel like health and performance are completely at odds. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested when, when people talk about the sugar, what is your answer with the diabetes or, you know, the, all of the cavities that we're going to get or the impact on health? What mm -hmm. is your answer to that? When you balance that out with fueling the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we have a neutral view on food, right, and we know sugar does not cause diabetes, I would say like you are metabolically active, very healthy, like your body does not take that sugar and all of a sudden like you have diabetes that doesn't even like that doesn't make sense when we think about how diabetes is developed and how people get it right so when we actually look at that and like explain that to people. Um, and like your body's actually just using it like you're you're burning it off you're using it like that is actually making you healthier, right? I always say like a healthy diet is different for an athlete. Like this is actually like, if you weren't having the sugar, that would actually be unhealthy, right? Mm -hmm. Because you would be in a deficit. 
and you would have lots of bad things happen to your health as a result. So once they can start to shift that, um, then that's where, you know, oftentimes they can make those changes and they don't feel this guilt around it, right? Like we assign this like moral value to food often in our society. And it's like, no, like if you have juice in your fridge, you're not a bad person. If you (laughs) like, (laughs) but honestly, it's like, that's what it's come to. Um, Or, or it's like, you know, they have this idea about themselves as like a healthy person. And if someone sees them eat like a donut, then they're like, oh, my whole identity will be like completely ruined. Right. Like, it's like, they identify as healthy people and that's great, but like, let's redefine health, right? Like that looks different for someone who's training 20 hours a week in terms of what their diet needs to look like to fuel that. So well, I'll, we're ahead. in deep trouble if uh, if juice is the indicator <laughs> of how bad of people we are because we're at the bottom of society then with the amount we drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's become a secret weapon actually. Like I, when I grocery shop, I was like, okay, which one has the most carbohydrates? So it was like <laughs> six grams. I'm getting this. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. When you start to look for like, what has the most carbs? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Or after a workout, we've already been in like a drive-through line and Mark's like, what do you want? I was like, whatever has the most calories, like let's yeah. just-, <laughs> <laughs> just need all the food. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone is listening today and is thinking like they need a little bit of care in their life, um, yeah. <laughs> how, how do they work with you? Yeah. So, um, if they go to our website, blueprintnutrition.ca, you can book a clarity call. So we always book an initial call first, uh, where I just chat with you and learn about your goals and like, you know, kind of what you're, what you're looking for, for in some support, tell you a little bit about what, what I typically do with clients, um, to see if it's a good, good fit to work together. Um, so you can book that call, um, on our website. Um, you can also find me on Instagram. So my handle is at blueprint nutrition sport. Um, and so a message that way as well can be a good way to connect. And uh, for everyone listening, I would actually recommend following, even if you are not planning on working with her, um, the amount of actionable tips that you give. um, You're always sharing your journey and some really, really like valuable tips on nutrition. So worth a follow, even if you aren't planning on on working with Kara at this time. Um, A question we always ask is, who's your endurance icon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, I being a marathon runner, I often like, like to follow all the marathon runners out there. But even uh, when I was thinking about that, I think locally, like Krista Duchesne is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, being a dietitian and a mom and like kind of coming from like, the, you know, the, the more recreational runner to the elite runner. I think that's a pretty cool journey to see everything that she's accomplished and gone to the Olympics and stuff. So yeah, I would say she's definitely one of my endurance icons. That's a good one because she, she also just has given back to the sport in so many ways. Yes. Um, and Ooh. I love that she's like you is talking about like, what is, what is the healthiest way to go about this? Like she's yeah. such a great role model, but yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, We will definitely have you back. We have a whole list of things we want to cover with you. I think the day-to-day nutrition, we're going to want to talk about that whole idea of unlearning and the best way to do that. Um, And then I think supplements is one of those things that, I mean, we could talk to you forever. Nutrition (laughs) is a big thing. I think they call it like the fourth discipline in triathlon. Yes, (laughs) there's so much, there's so much to it for sure. (laughs) Well, we look forward to having you back, but thank you so much for joining us today. This was a blast. Thanks for having me. Wow. How great was that? I always learned so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training and we'll see you back next week.